Personally, and I kind of think that you made a little bit of a false dichotomy there, uh, Destiny. And Daryl made a very good point in, in sort of refuting that, right? Which is, your First Amendment is not at all threatened by being banned from every single social media platform in the United States. You acknowledge that, right? It sort of is. It's not. It's not. A, there's, there is no law being made by government. When you say that people are being deceitful, I don't think people are genuinely trying to be deceitful. I think they're selling you their perception of reality that they really do think is true. It's just that we happen to disagree on those perceptions. I, I want to I, I underscore something that you said. I think one of the most important things when you have a conversation with someone across the divide is to not assume they're a f***ing lunatic. Or right. evil. Or yeah. evil, or bad, or insane, or just extend a charitable, huh? CEO and co-founder of Minds, he's the reason we're all here tonight. A big round of applause for Bill. <laughs> Stephen Bonnell, you may know him as Destiny. He's a... He is a very popular YouTuber and political commentator, and he, he's definitely someone that's hard to put in a box. Um, I've been at a couple of events with this guy, and I never quite know what his position is going to be, which is super fascinating. Our first panelist is Chris Williamson. He is a YouTuber and the host of the very popular Modern Wisdom podcast. Come on up, Chris. <laughs> and then our next guest is Matthew Azraeli, the original publisher, CEO, and founder of The Post Millennial. He's also the founder of Base Records, which is one of our sponsors here tonight. Please welcome Matthew. This next gentleman I got to meet for the first time in person yesterday. He's very kind, very gracious with his time. Uh, he is an American philosopher and author and a founding faculty member at the University of Austin and the executive director of the National Progress Alliance. Please welcome Peter Bogosian. He's an international recording artist, a published author, actor, and leader of the Daryl Davis Band. He's perhaps best known as being the man who has single-handedly pulled about 200 people out of the KKK just by befriending them. Please welcome Daryl Davis. Question is, what if I changed my mind on recently? That's, that's right. Well, <laughs> I changed my mind from deciding to make a further career of music and going into studying and practicing rec race reconciliation. So uh, I now I just pick and, pick and choose the gigs that I want to do musically. But this thing has become a full-time thing because I love this country. I love everybody in this country. I've been in 62 countries around the world. I have performed in, in uh, all 50 states. I've been exposed to a lot of cultures. I know we can work it out. And it bothers me a great deal when I go somewhere and I see groups of different people getting along fine, and we don't have this in our own country. So I want to do something about it. So that's what I've changed my mind. Thank you. Let's go down the line. Well, I've, cha I've changed my mind about so much, it's hard to know what what to focus on, but one of the things I've changed my mind upon, on is the role that kindness should play in your engagements. And so I used to be, actually somewhat like Destiny, I, I used to be rather merciless for the truth when I had a conversation with people, but now I'll forward being kind to them and often, for me, kindness means speaking bluntly to people and speaking honestly to people. Not, there's a difference between being kind and being nice. You can be nice to someone by just lying to them about something. But to be kind to somebody, it takes, uh, um, you, you also have to watch your tone and you have to think about why you're engaged in the conversation in the first place. So in the last few years, I've changed my mind and raised my confidence in that if kindness is forwarded as one of the main motivations for conversation, it's kind of like a lodestar that will prevent the interaction from going poorly. It's, it's also a way to safeguard yourself from engaging with someone um, and having impure motivations. Nice. If everyone can just speak deep into the mic, too. 
Hi. <laughs> this is sufficient? Yes. Thank you. I think I've, uh, I think I've decided to not earnestly engage in a political project. I think that's my personal um, transformation. I don't believe that a political process ought to be instrumental in changing culture, nor do I believe that the two are necessarily even correlated. So, so that's all. I think I've actually changed my mind about people that change their mind. So I always thought for a long time that people who flip-flopped between different opinions, it was a sign of uh, not being certain. And since being on the show and spending a lot of time speaking to different people, all of the thinkers, all of the creators, all of the speakers that I respect the most are the people who change their mind quite regularly. Now, this isn't them having, uh, how would you say, loose opinions. It's just them being prepared to update their position when they find new evidence. And all of the creators that I respect the least are the ones who never admit that they're wrong, who never change their mind, and who never update their programming. I think the biggest thing I've changed my mind on in the past year has to do with platforming, I guess what we consider dangerous ideas or conspiracy theories. Um, I think that for a long time, there was this idea that if you just banned everybody that had an idea that you didn't like, eventually those ideas would go away. But the more I kind of think about how our democracy works and the idea that every person gets the same vote for our leaders, uh, the more I kind of realize I think we probably should be having challenging conversations. And the idea that we can't trust people to wade through challenging conversations about COVID-19, about lockdowns, about whatever other idea there might be out there that some people maybe don't want people to talk about, um, I think it kind of betrays the entire idea of our democracy. So I think these types of conversations should be front and center on every mainstream platform on the internet. Yeah, I think when, it, when there's sub-issues, you know, all the, whatever, climate change or, you know, conspiracy theories or, I, I don't have opinions about those things really. I, that's always fluctuating back and forth, depending on the information that I have today. But for the core principles, that, that's the foundational stuff that doesn't really change. And I don't think it's probably a good idea to be willing to change that foundational principle of like free speech, dialogue, and whatnot. But I'm, I'm curious your guys' take on, on being willing to change your mind about that. Anybody? I mean, this doesn't have to be like... Yeah. When I, so when I get a lot of people that talk about like platforming dangerous ideas and freedom of speech, um, the, the one thing that I wish people would recognize, this is a big fault that the right has, is freedom of speech is not free. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's like firearms, right? Like firearms are cool, I enjoy shooting, but by having more of them in the United States, people are gonna die to firearms. That's an unavoidable reality, having firearms in this country. But we have to acknowledge that for some freedoms that we have, for some freedoms that we value, there's gonna be a necessary trade-off or a cost to have that freedom. So when we talk about like freedom of speech, you know, the proliferation of certain ideas on the internet are probably gonna cause harm. There are gonna be some people that go and shoot up a school, bomb a building, um, get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated, whatever. Um, and we have to at least acknowledge that any conversation about like freedom of speech or these types of freedoms has to start with the recognition that there's gonna be pros and cons on any side of that argument that you occupy. There is no side where everything is just purely good with no downside whatsoever. I would, uh, I would actually like, so as the designated uh, right-wing representative on the panel, I would actually like to perhaps dispute this assertion from the perspective of one Nick Fuentes, right? Somebody who you've spoken with, I think, on multiple occasions. And of course, I'm not necessarily shaming you for that, but Fuentes is not nominally, he's not representative of, P, of mainstream ideas on the right. And largely, platforming Fuentes casts the right in this absurd light that is fundamentally divorced from reality. Fuentes, his positions are not mainstream by any means. 
I mean, didn't a lot of people say the same about Trump in 2016? Like, I feel like a lot of the media coverage of Trump was, this guy's a joke, he can't make it, everybody derided him in the media, they, there's no chance, it was whether it was making fun of McCain, whether it was another tape they got leaked, whether it was him saying that women that get abortion should go to jail, I think everybody thought that, like, that guy couldn't make it, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of people out there that had those opinions that we completely missed because we decided that he didn't represent anything in this country. So I guess when I have conversations with people like even Fuentes, I acknowledge that Fuentes is, he occupies a pretty niche position right now on the political spectrum. Um, there's, there's definitely no doubt about that. Extremely. Yeah, for sure. But I, but I think that there are, I think every extremist, and when I say extremist, I just mean like kind of niche political ideology. I think it kind of like stems from similar foundations where you've got a group of people in the country, they feel like they're unheard, and Fuentes speaks to those people, the same way that Andrew Tate might speak to somebody, the same way that Donald Trump might speak to somebody, the same way that Bernie Sanders might have spoken but to somebody. But here's the issue. I, I would actually uh, disagree with conflating a guy like Trump and a guy like Fuentes, because Fuentes espouses Catholic integralist nationalism, which is a niche of a niche of a niche. It's also entirely culturally dependent, right? And, you know, you're talking about perhaps Ireland, Portugal, Spain, maybe Quebec. You know, we're, these are all lapsed Catholic countries. This is not a serious idea, even if you have guys like Adrian Vermeule at Harvard who espouse integralism and who Fuentes, by the way, never cites. It's, it's, seri it's just not the same thing as somebody saying, hey, maybe we should reform our immigration policy. The two are, are fundamentally very, very different. Is it your view then that there are some people so beyond the pale that they should never be spoken to? You could talk to anybody you want, I really don't care. But the point is, when you talk to somebody, um, and this is where the conversation of platforming comes up, what, what you have to be mindful is, you know, nobody likes normie Republicans. Nobody likes them. They're boring, their ideas are shallow, they're pedantic. They're overly spiritualizing and moralizing, and it's terrible. And yet, despite this, they are the mainstream Republican caucus of this country. Now, it's not good streaming content to talk to these folks, and I'll give you that. However, unfortunately, you're going to have to pull up to a target, speak to a random 15-year-old woman who's 100 pounds overweight, and you're gonna have to get her opinion on something. And that's gonna be far more representative of American popular opinion than Nick Fuentes could ever hope to be. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily doubt that. That's probably true. But I just spent like a year on my stream going over trans issues and I'm kind of burnt out on that. It seems like that's all Republicans wanna talk about right now on the national level. Um, honestly, on the online kind of uh, platforms that I inhabit, uh, I noticed that it feels like the, kind of like the center right people, I'll say like, I'll say like Daily Wire-esque, that those people are pretty insulated. They don't really like talk to many people. Um, like on any panel that I go on where I'm talking to, admittedly smaller kind of like conservative people online, all of these people consider themselves like if not a little bit, like significantly to the right of people like uh, Ben Shapiro, to the right of people like the Daily Wire. So it, I don't know where like all the center right conservative people online are outside of the Daily Wire. It feels like they don't exist. It's just like these little collections of like very extremist people. Let me, let me tell you who the most right wing guy in America is, Destiny, right now. No, it's not you, random voice from the audience. <laughs> it's some guy with a boat. Some guy, somewhere in America, he lives maybe in Utah, maybe he lives in Texas, maybe he lives in New York State near the Finger Lakes. Yes. But the point is, ladies and gentlemen, some guy with a boat is the most right-wing person in America, and it doesn't even come close. The uninformed, apolitical individual is more right-wing than any politically involved person could ever hope to be. Okay, so me and Destiny both make our money by speaking to people on the internet. Is it our job to give a representative uh, spread of all different views? It's our show, it's my show, it's his show. He can speak to the people that he chooses to. If Fuentes is one of them, if he decides to tumble down a trans rabbit hole for a year, or if he decides to play StarCraft obsessively for three months without talking to anyone about everything, that's also his choice. Uh, I just wonder where, you know, coming from a content creator perspective, what obligation do you think that we have to speak to people that we don't want to speak to? As, as content creators, your first obligation is to make money. That's your first obligation, okay? I don't know.
<laughs> anyway, no, but it's true. That is your first obligation. However, if, we're, if we want to be fair about it, yeah, talk to Fuentes. Again, I don't care. But you also have to talk to some guy with a boat. You have to find whatever that political Why? equivalent is. Why? Why do you have to talk to them? If you want to be representative. But why do you want to be representative? If, again, if you want to actually have a mainstream Republican political position that is represented you on your platform, so me, if you want cor that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you said that the primary motive of the content creator is to make money. I disagree with that. I think content creators should, if they don't want to make money, they don't, whatever the content creators want to do, they should do independent of money. But if it's money, then why? would you need to speak to people who are representative if that won't make you as much money? Oh, I'm saying the point is to make money. But if you want to be, you know, morally, in my so opinion... I'm just curious. Is that your point? Is your point to make money, Chris? Is your point to make money, Stephen? Is that why you do what you do? I mean, not really. I mean, there's other things I could do to make more money. Um, I don't necessarily even disagree that it would be cool to talk to Republicans that represent more of, like, the spread of, like, where most Republicans are at. It's pretty... I think even sit on my stream, like, it's kind of exhausting talking to only like Christian nationalists and communists. When it's like 95% of America is not here, but gee, am I allowed to cuss up here? Yeah, uh, online content is Streaming like, on your channel. It's, it's overwhelmed with extremists. So it's very, it's, it is very tiring. I mean, I make an effort to reach out to, you know, the Matt Walsh's, the Michael Knowles, or, you know, whoever I can t try to tweet at and bully on Twitter until they jump on and talk. But like I said, I, I feel like a lot of the people in these kind of uh, realms, even like people like Crowder, um, are pretty insulated. They don't want to, like, to be fair for a lot of them, like, there's not much point in having an open conversation or debate, right? Like, they either win, in which case, who cares, or they lose and they look bad. So it's hard to get these guys to come out of their box to have a conversation. I imagine it's probably true for center-left people, too. I just don't engage with them as much because I'm kind of center-left. So just very, very quickly on that note, so what we do is we go out and have, with Spectrum Street Epistemology, we have, we set lines of tape up all over the world, and we have conversations with people. Anybody can come. Uh, they're free. They're open to public, and they're on sidewalks. So, but, but that's just what I do. I, I don't know why one would think that that's what other people have to do. I think, again, if your aim supposedly is to foster some kind of an inclusive or democratic dialogue, then you should. Now, that might not be the aim of a content creator. And again, I actually believe that the Per, you know, we're do, it's a job, guys. Come on, you know, and obviously you are making money doing it. However, you're right. You know, I don't want to belittle the um, integrity of anybody on this stage. But the thing I am trying to say is, if you do want to actually have a broader scope, a more representative scope, then yeah, you need to talk to boring people. But do you actually care who Destiny talks to, or are you just bitter that Fuentes is being considered more mainstream? But he isn't really being considered more mainstream. You just said, you just said that. Did I? Yeah. Okay, well. I, I think the idea is that, like, if I'm to, to, to I don't even have to steal in your position, because I think I largely agree with you. If the conservatives that I talk to on my stream every single day are, like, Christian nationalists, alt-writers, race realists, like, the impression that my audience is going to get is, like, oh, I guess the average conservative is, is like, a neo-Nazi, right? Which is not really fair. That's not really true um, for the average conservative. But, again, it's just really hard to find moderate people, really, anywhere on the internet. Like, moderate stuff just doesn't sell. Nobody likes it. It's not, like, exciting to do. Like, I go on panels and I describe myself literally as an establishment show, almost tongue-in-cheek, tongue -in because, like, every single person at, like, all of these events is, like, the most, like, anti-establishment person you can get, whether they're on the left or the right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I try to find it, but it's, again, it's really hard to bring them out of their bubbles. They all kind of inhabit the, their little safe spaces, yeah. I suppose my perspective is I made a living selling content to moderate conservatives, and there are plenty of them, but you just, they just don't have any content that's aimed for them. If you just, if you create it, they'll come. So no one, no one's talked to more extremists and racists than Daryl sitting up here. So I'm curious, I'm curious, Daryl, how, how do you see sort of actual racism and extremism versus you know more kind of normal conservatism? Like, do you see that being blurred more recently? Well, I mean, I've been doing this for now 41 years, and uh, to me, thank you, but. Uh, my, my specialty is talking to people who hate me, whether they're black people, whether they're white people, whether they're anybody else. And I have my share of detractors. I've been called every name but my own for what I do. And uh, on, on, a, uh, on an event over here with uh, Bill Altman a few years ago, uh, I got called a white supremacist. <laughs> no, you laugh, but ask him, it's true. Because I sat in a room with uh, Trump supporters. 
so I was called a white supremacist by, by another group of people. Uh, but you know, I, I enjoy talking to people who disagree with me, not to, to convert them or to force them into some other uh, reality other than their own, but to plant seeds and, and allow them to, to come to their own conclusion after talking to somebody like me who they've never had the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with. One's perception is one's reality. Whether their reality is real or not is their reality. And you are not going to change someone's uh, reality just by telling them it's wrong. Okay? If you want somebody's reality to alter or to change, what you have to do is offer them a better perception. And if they resonate with the perception or perceptions that you have offered, their reality will change because that perception becomes their reality. We often make the mistake of going after somebody's reality instead of offering them a better perception. So I specialize in talking to extremists, whether they are, are black supremacists, whether they are white supremacists, or whatnot. And we have these conversations. Some people realize they've gone down the wrong path and they change, others don't. There will be people on all sides who will go to their grave being extremists. There's no changing them. But if somebody is willing to sit down and have a conversation, then there is an opportunity to plant a seed, to plant a new idea. To, that's something that they don't hear within their own echo chamber. And then what happens is these people go home and they think about you know, the conversation they had. Just like tonight, when you all go home, you're going to think about what you heard tonight from all of us, not just people here, but the people that come on after us. All right, you're going to reflect on it. And then some of these people will say, you know, uh, what that guy Daryl said, you know, it made sense. Oh, but he's black. But what he said was true. Oh, but he's black. So they're having a cognitive dissonance. They realize what I said may make a lot of sense, but they don't want to believe it because it came from somebody that they believe is the enemy. And so nobody likes dilemma in their life. So it comes to a point where they have to make up their mind. Do I want to disregard his skin color and believe what I now know to be true and alter my ideology? Or do I want to consider his skin color and continue living a lie? That's their dilemma. I don't tell them to go in either direction. I let them come to that conclusion. And that, for me, seems to work a lot better, which has gotten me tons of robes and hoods and swastika flags, and you name it, I have it. Thank you. Is there anyone who is proudly and openly racist here? Just curious. Well, let me, let me ask a question. <clears throat> I, I hear all this, uh, the word, it, it seems to be a buzzword these days, nationalist. But there's always a prefix to it. Well, he's a white nationalist. He's a black nationalist. He's a Christian nationalist. He's, you know, a whatever nationalist. A, a nationalist, to me, is somebody who likes their nation. So why do we have to prefix it and qualify it? by saying a white nationalist. To me, that, you know, <clears throat> let, me, let, me, let me tell you my perception, okay? Back in the day, the, the racism thing was called white supremacy. I'm a white supremacist. I believe, you know, we, you know, we are the superior people. Everybody else is, is inferior. That's what makes me supreme. And people who believe that joined white supremacy movements. And the more people you had, the more violence was, was, was uh, perpetrated. The violence got so bad that the US Congress passed what were known as the Ku Klux Klan Acts of 1871 to drive the Klan underground. Those same acts of 1871, part of them is, is what became the act that we use from 1993 when we uh, uh, prosecute police for brutality. All right, so it drove the Klan underground. People began dropping out of these white supremacy movements because they were tied with murders and lynchings and dragging people behind vehicles, et cetera. So while some people may not have liked Jews or, not, or may not have liked blacks, they didn't want to associate themselves with these atrocities of bombing churches and dragging people and hanging people by the neck. So they dropped out. And in order to, to, to gain more membership, they rebranded. 
and the rebrand was called white separatist. I don't hate black people or Jews, I just love my own kind. You know, blacks should have their own schools, their own swimming pools, their own restaurants. We should be able to have ours, okay? So that's called separatism. So I'm a, I'm a white separatist, all right? I like that idea. More people joined these movements, and it grew. With the growth, again, came more violence. So now uh, white supremacists, white separatists became unpalatable. So now you have to rebrand again in order to lure people in. Do you like your country? Yeah, I like my country, I love my country, I'm a patriot. What color are you? I'm white. So, well, you're a nationalist if you like your country, and because you're white, you're a white nationalist. That term is also equated in many circles with white supremacy. Why can't you just say, I'm a nationalist, I love my country? Why do you have to qualify it by the color of your skin or your religion? Yes. Pardon me? Division. Division, exactly. So why, do, why would you want division in a country that we call ourselves united? Amen. If I could field that question, I think it's because, and again, maybe I've been talking too much and there are other people who are more interesting here, but... Um, I think that's because uh, America is fundamentally a revolutionary project. So, you know, for lack of a better term, it's a fundamentally left-wing project. At least that's my belief as the founders envisioned it, right? So the idea of nationalism being not appended as something negative has a very, very um, problematic position in the minds of many Americans because of its associations across the 20th century with right-wing movements and far-right movements. And I think that America, in many ways, is actually allergic to conservatism or to the right, and that's why you have, unfortunately, nationalism, which is not necessarily even right-wing, by the way. Right, but it, nationalism, all kinds of nationalism. Yeah, that's right. And so it's just, but it's become associated with the right in a way that is unpalatable to most Americans. I feel like w w the problem with the whole nationalist idea is that there, there's two big kind of parts of it that I think give people pause, and I think rightfully so. Um, one is that when people start calling themselves nationalists, oftentimes they get very obsessed with defining what it means to be an American. So in a lot of conversations I have, if somebody calls themselves like an American nationalist, sometimes the next part of the conversation is going to be how true Americans are those that come from white European stock or something. So even if they don't call themselves a white nationalist, there's like this kind of like ethnic undertone to a lot of the stuff they talk about, which isn't necessarily everybody, but there is like that aspect to it, um, such that when I hear somebody call themselves like a nationalist, or even a Christian nationalist or whatever, I kind of wonder if there's like an ethnic undertone. There doesn't have to be. The second thing that I think is more broadly applied is I hate it when people call themselves like part of a movement where like if you're not that thing, you kind of feel like an asshole. Like imagine if you made like the, you know, like, uh, like, you know, the pro-school movement, right? It's like, well, what am I? Am I anti-school? Or you made yourself like the pro, like, feed-hungry children movement. It's like, well, fuck me. Am I like, you, do I want children to starve or whatever? Um, I, th I think one of the problems when you have, like, people that consider themselves, like, nationalists or part of a nationalist movement is that everybody that's outside of their group necessarily isn't. Um, I remember growing up a lot for this. I, I was very much in the neocon era. I love George W. Bush, support of the Iraq War. My parents are super strong Republicans. They still are. And uh, I remember that so many conversations revolved around whether or not you supported the troops. And supporting the troops became a proxy for the entire Republican agenda. And if you disagreed with any of it, if you disagreed with Iraq, if you disagreed with Afghanistan, it wasn't that you disagreed with foreign policies. You hated the country. You weren't patriotic. You hated America. And I think that's kind of a frustrating thing in dealing with a group of people that call themselves a nationalist, because it feels like to take a contrary position, almost by definition, I guess I must hate the country, which I think is a frustrating thing, like rhetorically, to navigate around. Talking of rhetoric, one of the things I was interested in was what you said at the start, Peter, which was around the usefulness of kindness. And we discussed earlier on about some of the challenges of content creation online. The sorts of content that captures most people's attention, that can sometimes be used to be representative, even though it's not, it's just the one that is the most limbically hijacking, which makes it seem like it's the most representative because it gets the most clicks and plays. All of those often trigger a response in people which is the precise opposite of changing your mind. 
right? So the soft signal of effectiveness, to me, suggests that if you care about changing somebody else's mind, you will dial back the aggression of your argument to allow it to land. Everybody knows what it feels like to have some sacred cow that they care about be trodden on in front of them, and they go, okay, fuck you. You want to go? Fine. Well, okay, that, that's the end of the discussion. So what I'm seeing on the internet at the moment are hopefully the beginnings, the burblings of an underground movement of people who want to have conversations, who aren't going out swinging, trying to make the other side look as stupid as possible. I hope that we're in the death throes of that happening. There's always going to be a place for it because it's always going to create uh, attention online. However, I'm hoping that the more that people can realize, if I care, and you said it earlier on, if you care about actually having this sort of an impact, it's about taking people one step at a time gently through the arguments, allowing them to arrive at the position that they're at themselves. No one has ever been ridiculed or patronized into changing their mind, as far as I can see. Right, and we know from the literature, the peer-reviewed literature, that people change their mind from a feeling, from a position of psychological safety. And we also know from Daryl's experience that that has been borne out over and over again. So we know how to do that. We know that it's listening at the core. We know that it's seeing you as a human, as a musician. You often relate on that level to people. And so the, 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 the problem is that there really is something, and I've noticed this in our videos too, if people are freaking out and giving in the Zeke Heil, those videos take off and the unfortunate thing is what you want to do is you want to model civil conversations because right now we're not having that. And it's literally killing us. It's amazing to me, I'm 56. It was mind blowing to hear people talk about a national divorce. I know if you're younger and you've been in kind of that word has been in the milieu, that's, in, that's fucking insane. Like you're talking about splitting up the country? So, there is an urgency to this, and there's an urgency to get back to those basics of how do we talk to each other, specifically across divides, across people who hate you just for who you are. And I don't think that content creators, maybe we disagree, I don't think the purpose of content creation is to make money or even ameliorate some kind of a social, s something wrong in society, but it would certainly be good if those conversations were more oriented toward that the problem is that people don't like those conversations. They like the fireworks. They like the screaming. So I think we have to look in the mirror and do work on ourselves for what is going to make a society better. Because we're ultimately responsible for the kind of society we create in a democracy. I used to think this. Um, <clears throat> I used to think that extremist content sold really well, and stuff that was kind of more moderate was boring, and, and nobody would watch it. I'm pretty sure I've said stuff like this. You can find a lot of uh, my videos where I say almost exactly that, that nobody wants to watch a moderate position. But I think what happens is, is I think that people that inhabit the extremes they spend a lot of time working on their rhetoric. They're usually really funny. They're, like watching, like I don't like Alex Jones or a lot of those he stands for. But he does a really good show. <laughs> okay, like, and that's true of like almost every extremist content creator. They do really funny work. I think that you can get people to watch more moderate conversations, but like it can't come from a place of kind of like condescension, uh, like enlightened, patronizing, you know, kind of conversational tones. It, it can still be like fun and exciting, and you can get like a little bit rowdy. But there has to be some sort of mutual respect, and like you said, there has to be like a safe landing pad for people to kind of explore ideas. I just think that people that are trying to do the moderate conversation thing, I think they need to work a little bit harder on that idea in and of itself. Well, look, it's, it's, it's moderate. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm having both sides, like, come and have conversations. You should be watching me. That's not enough. It's got to be entertaining, too. And I, and I think that people need to work harder at that aspect. I hope. I hope that's the case. If it's fucking boring, no one's going to watch it in any case. Doesn't matter how moderate it is, you know? No, that's true. But there's, there's boring extremists, too. They just don't make it very far, right? So here's, here, here's, here's one thing. So people often ask me, well, what is something I can do? What, what can I do? Here's one thing you can do. Every time so I ask someone a question and they say, I don't know, I say, that's a great answer. That's a fantastic answer. Because if every time someone did that, instead of making someone feel stupid, they said, oh, that's a, that's a really good answer. If all of us did that, we would stop making a culture of people who pretend to know things they don't know. And that is part of our problem. I'll give you uh, two, two quick examples of perception and reality. Um, one will be hypothetical, one will be real. So let's say, for example, you have a seven or eight-year-old brother who goes with his buddies to a magic show. And he comes home and he tells you, you're not going to believe this. This magician on stage, he asked for a female volunteer. Fifty women raised their hands. He scanned the audience. He picked out one, brought her up on stage. 
and he had her climb into this long box and stick her feet out the hole at this end and stick her head out the hole at this end, and then he closed the lid and he took a chainsaw and went right down the middle of the box and right down through the bottom. He cut her in half and then he asked her to wiggle her feet out that hole and she wiggled her feet after she was cut in half. And you say to him, listen, it didn't really happen like that. Yes, it did. I was there. You weren't even there. Okay? You have attacked his reality. He knows what he saw. How dare you tell me that I didn't see something when you weren't even there? You want to tell me what I didn't see? You have attacked his reality. He is going to push back and fight you. All right? And then to make it even more real to you, he tells you that after the man cut the uh, woman in half, and she wiggled her feet, he separated the two halves of the box, took the uh, half with the feet, moved it over here to stage uh, right, took the half with the head and moved it over there to stage left, and then he walked over there and talked to the lady's head, and she talked back to him, right? And then he brought the two halves back together, he did some abracadabra incantation above the box, and then he opened the lid, and she climbed out you know, full form, no blood, nothing. He cut her in half and put her back together. And you say, listen, it's an illusion. No, it wasn't, I'm telling you. It happened, I saw it with my own eyes. Again, you have attacked his reality. And he's gonna fight you. There's no way you're gonna change anybody's reality. What you do is you offer him a better perception. You say, listen, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but do you think that maybe, just maybe, it's possible that perhaps, you know, you said 50 women raised their hand and he picked out one and brought her up on stage. Do you think maybe it's possible that perhaps she knows the trick? She works for him. She travels all over the country with him and sits in that same theater seat in every theater she goes to so he can spot her immediately, bring her up on stage. And then when she gets in that box and puts her feet out that hole, there's actually a pair of mannequin legs laying on the floor of the box. She picks up those poles and shows them out the hole and brings her own knees up under her chest. So her whole body is on that half of the box. Uh, you, you ruined it for me. Hold on, I know, but I'm, I know. So, so then Sorry. the saw never even touches her. And so of course she can shake those, those, those poles and wiggle those feet. But then when she separate, when the magician separates the, the, the half of the box with the feet over there, those feet can no longer move. And he brings the, the uh, head over here. He doesn't want you looking at those feet because he, he can't control them now, right? So your eyes are gonna follow him. He goes over here and talks to her head. Of course she's gonna talk back. Her whole body is in that half of the box. So then he brings the two halves back together. She pulls those mannequin legs out, leaves them on the floor of the box, and she climbs out full form, no blood, no nothing. And then, your eight-year-old, seven-year-old brother says, hmm, you know, that might be the only way that can work. You have offered him a better perception and allowed it to resonate with him, and then he has changed his own reality. That's how we, uh, how we affect reality, by offering better perceptions rather than attacking somebody's reality. I, I want to just throw something in. I don't, I don't know if you heard what he did, but did you see he did two things in the beginning of that? The first thing he did was he, he asked a question. The second thing he did was he said, is it possible? Here's an explanation. Is this explanation possible? So you, you put someone in a situation where, where, where are they, is he supposed to say no to that? Like, no, it's not possible. So right then and there, you created a window of doubt. Questions and the Socratic questions are the best, in my opinion, and then, is this possible? You're not telling anybody anything, although at the end we did, but questions and then asking. The, uh, the real life example, a guy that I know very well or knew very well, he had the largest Klan group, KKK group in this country. And uh, <clears throat> if he had lived for about another year, he would have been out of the clan. He and I were becoming very close, and I could see him changing his mind. But uh, he was murdered, and I, I knew him very well. I knew the murderer very well. I knew his whole family. And I went to his funeral and participated in his funeral, playing uh, gospel hymns on the piano and you know, for the service and all that kind of stuff. And his parents, his mother and father, and his uh, three sisters were there. He was the only male. 
and these are all adult uh, children. I'd never met his family before. They had nothing to do with the Klan. They did not believe in that, in that ideology whatsoever. They didn't understand why their son and brother was involved in this kind of stuff. Uh, but they knew about me, and they were very happy that he was becoming good friends with me. I got to meet them, and the father began calling me, like, you know, once, twice a week. And just, just to, to talk with somebody who knew his son and wasn't involved in the Klan. And he was, he was really feeling the loss of his son. One day I was sitting in my living room and he called. He told me he had a gun in his hand and he was gonna go and kill the murderer. And uh, he was crying and he was very emotional, very angry. And I knew I had to reach him somehow to, to not let him do this. I said, look man, Frank is gone. He's not coming back, all right? If you go, if, if, if I told him that, you know, yeah, you know, you go and kill the murderer, yeah, that's gonna give you some satisfaction, because he felt that the murderer took his only son, the murderer needs to be eliminated. I get it, I, I might feel the same way if somebody took, you know, my kid, I don't have any kids, but if I did, all right? I, I get it, but if I, if I went to him logically, because he was acting very emotional, so you gotta reach him on an, an emotional level, not on a logical level at this point. If I told him, look, you know, if you, if you go and kill this person, you're already an old man. You're gonna go to prison and you're gonna die in prison because you're gonna get 40 years. And you, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna live another 40 years anyway. So why do you wanna do that? If I did that, he wouldn't care. His answer would be, this person needs to die. You know, took my son, end of story. So I had to reach him on an emotional level. I said, listen, Frank is gone. He's not coming back. You have three beautiful daughters. You've lost your son. Do you want to uh, lose your, your daughters as well? Okay, they live in Missouri. I live in Maryland, so I'm out there in Missouri, but I was home when he called me. And I said, listen, you know, they're gonna lock you up, and they're not gonna put you in, in, in prison in Missouri. They're gonna put you in, in uh, San Quentin out in California or Rikers Island in New York to make it difficult for your family to come visit you. That's also part of your punishment. They don't you know, put you in prison right next door so you see your family every day. No. I said, you're going to lose your three daughters. Is that what you, you know? You've lost a son. Now, do you want to lose your three daughters? That is what stopped him from going and killing this person. And like Peter said, I asked a question and let him answer. You know, I, I could say, man, don't go do that, man. You know, you, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to get caught. You know, he, he didn't care at that point. How, how do you deal with somebody who doesn't care if they die or if they go to jail? But his son, his family meant that much to him. Had he forgotten about these three girls that also could mean something to him? He's going to lose three more after he lost his son. He came to the conclusion, I need to change my direction. Daryl, something you told me uh, backstage before is that you're, you were... Good. Was it me? I don't know. Was that you were good friends with uh, Chuck Berry? And Chuck Berry was my friend, my mentor, my hero, uh, my boss. I played for Chuck Berry for 32 years. You know, anybody who loves rock and roll music, I don't care if it's Elvis Presley, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, Metallica, Elton John, anybody who plays rock, all of their DNA goes back to Chuck Berry. Yeah. And something very interesting, to me at least, is that You've dedicated so much of your life and your career now to changing people's minds, altering their perspectives, and that's really the power of music, isn't it? It is indeed. I mean, for example, let's say, oh, tonight's Saturday night, right? So I don't have a gig. I'm here with you guys. So let's just say uh, I'm off, you know, I'm not playing, and I, you know, I, I play full time, you know, so I make a living. So I have a Saturday night off. Maybe I want to be entertained rather than be the entertainer. So there's a bar down the street from my house, a club, or whatever. Either they have a DJ or a live band. I feel like dancing, so I'm gonna go to down, down to the club and look, you know, want to dance. So I go there. There's a good song playing. The dance floor is full. I'm looking around, see if I see an unattached uh, female that I can dance with. And I see this lady right here. What's your name? Lindsay. So I don't know Lindsay, but I see Lindsay sitting at the bar by herself. She's not with that guy, and <laughs> and she's sitting there doing this in time to whatever song is playing, right? So obviously she likes the song. I'm gonna go over there and ask her if she wants to dance because I like the song too. So I don't know her. I go over there and I say, excuse me, you know, would you care to dance? She's gonna say, yeah. And she pops off her bar stool, we go out onto the dance floor, and she and I are dancing together. If it's a slow song, we're like this, slowly turning around on the floor. 
If it's a fast song, we're apart, shaking, whatever else, right? At the end of the song, I escort her back to her bar stool. I thank her for the dance. I say, by the way, my name is Daryl. She says, I'm Lindsay. And I say, so Lindsay, you know, you know, what do you do? And she tells me she's uh, vice president of uh, Microsoft marketing on the East Coast. Whoa. She's making half a million dollars a year. And she says to me, what do you do? And I tell her, uh, I'm, a, I'm a bus boy at Applebee's. <laughs> what, what am I making? You know, $9,000 a year, right? Where would two people that far apart come this close? Music. And you know, one thing I learned, that's right, music, music is a universal language. I met, I met the first Klansman that I had a positive experience with. I, <laughs> I was playing in a uh, country band. Country had made a resurgence. In fact, uh, it was a movie that was filmed right here in Texas called Urban Cowboy, yeah. right, with John Travolta and the mechanical bull and all the line dances and stuff. So country had never gone away. I like country music, but it was, not, it was no longer mainstream top 40. And, but when that movie came out, it was so popular, all the bars and clubs changed their music format to country. And uh, you know, the blues and country music are one and the same. It's the same three chords. All right, it's, it's, it's society that divides us. All right, so I joined this country band. I can play country music as well as anybody else. So I joined this country band, and we were playing in a, in a club in a town called Frederick, Maryland, which is about an hour and 20 minutes uh, north of Washington, D.C. And um, yeah, and this club called the Silver Dollar Lounge had the reputation of being an all-white lounge. Black people were not welcome. There were no signs, you know, like you, know, you saw back in the day of you know, colored restroom, all that kind of stuff, nothing like that. But it had that reputation. You knew if you were black, you were not welcome there. And you know, when you go somewhere where you're not welcome and alcohol is being served, it's not always you know, a good combination, right? So here I am in the Silver Dollar Lounge. I'm the only black guy in the band, only black guy in the club. And um, the band had played there before. So we finished the first set. And I'm, I'm following the band over to the band table, and I feel somebody from behind come up and put their arm across my shoulder. Now, I don't know anybody in this joint, right? So I'm looking around to see who's touching me, and it was this white gentleman, you know, considerably older than me, maybe 15, 18 years older, and a big smile on his face. He says, man, I sure love your all's music. And I said, thank you, I shook his hand. And he pointed at, at the bandstand and said, I've seen this here band before, but I ain't never seen you before. Where'd you come from? And I explained to him, well, I just joined the band a couple months ago, but yes, you know, you have seen them. They told me they played here before. He says, man, I sure like your piano playing. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. And I was not, I was not, yeah, I was not offended, but I was rather surprised, given this guy's age being older than me, that he did not know the black origin of Jerry Lee Lewis's piano style. And I proceeded to tell him, well, Jerry Lee got it from the same place I did, from black blues and boogie-woogie piano players. That's where rock and roll rockabilly evolved. No, oh, no, 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 Jerry Lee invented that. I ain't never seen no black man play like that except for you. So I'm thinking, okay, well, the dude never saw Fats Domino or Little Richard, you know, same boogie style, right? And um, I said, look, man, I know Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee's a good friend of mine. He's told me himself where he learned how to play. The guy didn't believe that either. But he was so fascinated with me, he wanted me to come back to his table and let him buy me a drink. I don't drink alcohol, but I agreed to go back and have a cranberry juice. He paid the waitress, he took his glass, and he clinked my glass and cheered me. And then he says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. Now I'm really mystified, like how can this be? You know, because at that point in my life, I'd sat down literally, literally with thousands of white people or anybody else and had a meal, a beverage, a conversation. This guy, a decade and a half at least older than me, had never sat down with a black guy. And I know for a fact that there are black people in Frederick, Maryland. I've seen them. So, you know, <laughs> how did he miss them all, right? And so, I, you know, I wasn't trying to be facetious. I, I innocently, I said, why? He looked down at the table, didn't say anything. I said, why? And his buddy said, tell him, tell him, tell him. I said, tell me. He looked back at me just as plain as day, and he said, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I burst out laughing at the guy, because now I didn't believe him, right? And so I know a lot, I know a whole lot about the Klan. And I know they don't just come up and embrace a black guy and want to hang out and buy him a drink and you know, praise their, you know, their musical talent. So I figured the guy's you know, jerking me around, because, probably because he thought I was jerking him around about Jerry Lee Lewis. He went inside his pocket, pulled out his wallet, flipped through it, and handed me his Klan membership card. I instantly recognized the red circle with the white cross and red blood drop in the center. Whoa. 
this thing is for real. You know, it wasn't funny anymore. So I gave it back to him, stop laughing. But we talked about the Klan and many other things. He was very friendly, and he gave me his phone number. And want, yeah, he gave me his phone number and wanted me to call him any time I was to return to this bar with this band, because he wanted to bring his friends, you know. Right? <laughs> he wanted to bring his friends to see, as he put it, the black guy who plays piano like Jerry Lee. I'm not sure he called me a black guy to his friends, but that's how he explained it to me, right? And so I would call him every six weeks. Say, you know, I'd call him on a Thursday, a Wednesday or a Thursday, and say, hey man, you know, we're down to Silver Dollar this week, and come on out. He'd come out Friday and Saturday with Klansmen and Klanswomen, not in robes and hoods, but you know, in regular street clothes. And they would gather around the stage and watch me play with the band, and, and then they'd get on the dance floor and dance, and on my break, I would make my way over, over to the table, say hello, thank him for coming, I'd meet some of these people. Some of them did not want to meet me. A couple of them would like get up and see me coming, they'd move to the other side of the room. So the message was, you know, we don't want to shake your hand, we don't want to talk to you, we just want to look at you. And that's fine. The other ones, you know, they were interested, and we would converse. And it was through this exposure, through this conversation, that I, that I got an, an, an entry into this world, and which prompted me later on to write the book. I wrote the first book by a black author on the Ku Klux Klan from the perspective of face-to-face -face interviews because music brought us together. And I can tell you something right now, because I've had to do this before. Had I gone into that bar, not as a musician, just as some guy just going there to listen to music and dance, I would have had to fight my way out of there. But it was the music that brought us together. And that is the power of music. And thank you for the dance. Yeah. <laughs> Daryl, you're a fucking warrior. All right, so we have a few people, uh, creators on Minds who want a contest who are gonna come up. Uh, so Lucy, you out there? Welcome her. All right, so we asked, uh, we asked everyone to bring a, a topic and uh, yeah. Lucy, what's up? So, first of all, thank you for this discussion. Um, I joined Minds a month ago, and two weeks ago, I was elected by the community to join this panel, so I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Our pleasure. Um, and the topic I want to discuss is freedom. I moved to America about two months ago from the UK. And I realized that everyone in America was fighting for freedom, right? It was people on the left who were fighting for free people, free community, freedom of choice. It was people on the right who were fighting for free speech, freedom of religion. And then I realized, so what's, like, what's the issue? Why is uh, America so polarized, right? Why can't we just get along? And then I realized, well, it's because we have different perceptions of freedom, right? The left and the right don't agree what freedom means. And then I connected this to a philosopher called Isaiah Berlin, who broke down uh, the definition of freedom into a positive concept and negative concept, right? So the positive freedom is freedom to fulfill your potential, right? So what the Democrats are saying is you have freedom to education and healthcare, you have freedom to resources that will allow you to become who you want to become. What the Republicans are saying is uh, we want freedom from interference by the government, right? So we want free speech, freedom of religion, freedom to protest. And so my question to the panel is, um, what is your definition of freedom? Do you believe that negative freedom is more important than positive freedom? Do you believe that like the Bill of Rights are you know, the most important freedoms that we should have? Do you believe that uh, there's other freedoms that people should be granted? Well, I mean, I can't answer for everybody, but I can answer for myself. A lot of that started back uh, at, during the Civil War. And if you go to a northern state high school, you are taught that the Civil War was fought over slavery. And that is true. If you go to a southern high school, you were taught, no, 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 no. The, the Civil War was fought over states' rights. Yes, that is true too. The state's right to own a slave. Okay, so, you know, there, there are two different perspectives. And oftentimes, you know, the right and the left may share some, some commonality in the freedoms that they want. But the state's rights is what, is, is what, uh, is what started that, that negative and positive 
uh, freedom thing. So it's perspective. Yeah, well said. Um, Oh, yeah. you, so this is a very easy question to cheat on. So you could say, well, you need both, or they're both related to each other. But uh, now I'm going to pressure the rest of the panel. But I think, is your question, choose one which is more important? So choose one. So don't, let's, not, let's not try to cheat the question. So I think that negative freedom is more important. And the reason that I think it's more important, well, one of the reasons that I think that negative freedom over time will lead to positive freedom, but I don't see positive freedom leading to negative freedom. So if I were to choose one and I only had one to choose, I would say negative freedom. So negative freedom, I think historically, was called liberty, right? The liberty, the ability to do something, right? Um, and I'm from Canada, and in Canada we had, uh, you know, we've had quite a few years of COVID lockdowns. We've had quite a few years of um, a lack of liberty, and it's to the extent now, this is from the government's own uh, own statistics, we have this thing made, medical assistance in dying. So you have the freedom to go to a panel of doctors, and then they can kill you. What a freedom. What a free country. Now, in 2021 alone, over 10,000 Canadians were killed by MAID. Now, we have a population in about a tenth of the United States. So that's, you know, you know, you could, if you scale it up, perhaps that's not correct to do that, but that would be about 100,000 people, over 100,000 people in the United States, which is only double the amount of gun deaths per year in this country. But 100,000 people is really a lot of people, actually, right? Or 10,000 people, quite frankly, is a hell of a lot of people. And when we get to the point where the government says, yes, we'll take care of you, we'll provide you with housing, we'll provide you with health care. But then when somebody applies for health care, it's a 10-month wait for a basic procedure. Or when they apply for housing, they're put on a federal wait list of eight months or more. Well, then the government can come in. in and say, all right, well, now you're free to do something else. Um, I'm a little skeptical of that. And so, so is your answer negative freedom? Freedom? And then? Liberty, yes. Being British and coming over to America, the uh, learnings about the sensitivity and sacredness of the word freedom is something that I've had to spend an awful lot of time getting accustomed to. Um, from my perspective, it seems like the negative freedom makes an awful lot more sense because you are opening up people to develop stuff down the line. If you're trying to hand people freedoms piecemeal, there is always going to be a gap in that freedom which isn't handed to them. So for me, negative freedom, please. Yeah, just a quick, a quick something quickly on that thought. If you gave people positive freedom, but you, they didn't have negative freedom, over time they would lose the ability to understand the argument at all. You would need negative freedom so that you could even have a conversation about why you would choose negative freedom or positive freedom. I've only just become introduced to this concept three seconds ago, but... Um, <laughs> It seems to me like negative freedom is a principle and positive freedom is more like a policy. That negative freedom scales because it doesn't need to be targeted individually, it's just get the fuck out of the way, as opposed to positive freedom which appears to be more uh, policy based. We are going to have this individually and this individually and this individually. Negative freedom is Bill of Rights, yeah. Written in. I mean, man, you really... You really did this, huh? Uh, I, I mean, picking one or the other is pretty difficult, but I mean, a man dropped off in the middle of a jungle with, with no food and no water has an infinite amount of negative freedoms. I don't see that guy having a very good outcome, you know, for his existence. Um, for, for, you know, being only afforded positive freedoms, I, I mean, you could argue that to some extent, like a child lives that way, right? You don't have very much freedom. Uh, you sure as hell don't have freedom of speech uh, under your father's roof. You sure as hell don't have the freedom to own a firearm. You don't have freedom to do a lot of things as a child. Um, but I would argue the development of a child, you know, that's being given a bunch of things by their parents, it's probably more positive than the uh, family dropped off in the middle of the jungle with nothing. So uh, 
I'd say probably positive freedoms are, are more important than the negative ones, but I think that any one could theoretically lead to the other, that a society given enough education, given enough uh, opportunity to exceed, would probably begin to demand some sort of negative freedoms as well. Um, we keep saying that in other countries with developing markets, we've said this about China for like three decades now, that as people gain more money and more autonomy, that they're going to demand, or as they gain more money, they're going to demand more autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, would, I would hope that people given enough positive freedom would eventually start to demand the negative ones as well. Um, but I mean, given only negative freedoms and no other resources, I mean, you could cease to exist pretty quickly, I would imagine. I, I would, to, uh, I would qu my question would be, who determines what is negative and what is positive? It seems like, like, like we're being told this is negative freedom and that's positive freedom. Well, who has the authority to call this negative and that positive? It seems to me that from the, the, the description of positive freedom is um, you have the freedom, you have freedom only if you do what I tell you. So, that, so to me, positive freedom is like Jim Crow. Okay, so you know, yeah, you know, you can you can drink from water fountain, but it has to be that one. You can ride the bus, but it's got to be in the back. So you have the freedom to ride the bus, you have the freedom to use the restroom or the water fountain, but it has to be a separate one. It's the one, as you point out, policy that that I have to, that I'm dictated to do. So I have the freedom to use those things. So, you know, my question is, who determines what's positive and what's negative? If if you only had negative freedom. You, you would have a, a society of zombies. You, you would have a society who is incapable of understanding why one would be better than the other. And the example of the jungle, if you only had, if you were trying to figure it out what you'd want to do, that kind of starts with the assumption that somebody had negative freedom. I don't know. Actually, I don't think it's that complicated, quite frankly. And I kind of think that you made a little bit of a false dichotomy there, uh, Destiny. And Daryl made a very good point in, in sort of refuting that, right? Which is, yes, you can have absolute liberty. And of course, the libertarian ideal is Somalia for that reason, right? We would all love to live in Somalia as pirates. Sounds kind of fun. But but the point is this, that, you know, negative liberty, or sorry, negative freedom, which again, I would characterize just very simply as liberty, right? As opposed to the ability to do things if they're like free. And I don't know how that's positive freedom. I don't know how that's positive anything. I mean, I, I give you a really great example that every single conservative here agrees with. Every single conservative here understands that negative freedom means nothing without positive freedom. Now, normally they wouldn't. However, I'm pretty sure after this or in the panel after that, we're going to have a huge conversation about how pointless the First Amendment is, the negative freedom, without the positive freedom to not be banned from places like YouTube and Twitter. That's an example of pairing a positive with a negative. You can have freedom of speech, but if you're banned with ev from every single social media platform in the United States, it sure doesn't feel like that negative freedom means very much. I actually, no. That's an example of, as it's characterized by my understanding, a positive freedom, right? There's an infrastructure. The infrastructure is given to people, and there's an entitlement to that uh, positive freedom. This is kind of a neb This is sort of turned into a semantic argument. Well, no, I don't think it's semantic at all. It's very, very clear. Your First Amendment is not at all threatened by being banned from every single social media platform in the United States. You acknowledge that, right? It sort of is. It's not. It's not a, there's, there is no law being made by government that is abridging your right to freedom of speech. The First Amendment does not guarantee you access to any social media platform. But if you don't have any access to any social media platform, it kind of feels like you don't have very much freedom of speech. No, I mean, you listen, at the end of the day, so it's a very good question, it's right? It's topic for the next panel. Yeah, so. fair, <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair, I'm just saying fair the, enough. The, the, it's, it's frustrating on the left sometimes to hear conservatives talk about the importance of all the freedoms, but it, it, depending on your life situation, if you don't have the ability to access those freedoms, it sure doesn't feel like it, you know? Yeah. People ask me, you know, like, do you like the United States? Why do you live here if you don't like it, blah, blah, blah? I think the United States is the best country in the world if you've got a lot of money. If you don't have a lot of money, in some ways, the United States kind of sucks. You don't have a right to an education, or healthcare is the actual access is iffy, depending on how much money you've got. Um, where you live might suck. Like, there's a lot of issues if you don't have a lot of money in the United States. So I, I think that the positive and the negative, I'm sorry you did this to us, but I think you do have to take into account both of them, and you can't just choose one, because one without the other, I think essentially becomes meaningless. Yeah, e echoing, um, <laughs> echoing what you said, Peter, you know, socialism or positive freedom can exist within libertarianism in a you know, micro little community where people decide they want to do that, but the, the inverse is not true. So I would have to say, I agree with calling it liberty, though. I'm not going to play this polarity game. Um, so thank, thank you, you, Lucy, for coming on. Thank you.
Good question. Can I, am I only asking a quick question? Yeah. I'm, I'm super curious for Daryl. Um, I've heard your TED Talks. Um, you're, uh, I super admire everything you do. It's really cool. The idea of reaching out to people that, are, <laughs> that disagree with you about as much as anybody possibly could. Um, one thing that I haven't heard you talk about that I have heard other people talk about is what is the pushback you get or how do you deal with the pushback from your own community about the types of things you do? So for instance, I imagine, I don't know this, but I imagine that other black people are probably really critical of you engaging with Ku Klux Klan people and give you a lot of heat for that. How do you, how do you deal with that type of criticism? Okay, first of all, my community is everybody, white, black, or otherwise, okay? And you're saying, um, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I just want to point out something. You know, how, how do you deal with other black people? Well, not all black people are my detractors. I have some black supporters, but I certainly do have some black uh, detractors. I've been called an Uncle Tom, I've been called an Oreo, I've been called a race trader, I've been called all kinds of things. Um, but you know what? I have seen, I have seen it work. And let me just tell you, just to give you just a little bit of background, I first started traveling around the world at the age of three, because my parents were US Foreign Service, so I was an American Embassy kid. My first exposure to school was overseas. We started traveling in 1961 at the age of three. I, I went to kindergarten, first grade, third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, all in different countries around the world. My, my classes over there, it's probably the 1960s, my classes overseas were filled with kids from all over the world. Japan, Russia, Nigeria, Italy, Czechoslovakia, France, Germany, you name it. If those countries had embassies where we were assigned, all of their kids went to the same school. So that being my first exposure to school became my baseline for what school should be. But every time I'd come back home, because you, know, you get assigned to a country for two years, and then you're back to the States. Whenever I'd come back home, um, I would be in either all black schools or black and white schools, meaning the still segregated or the newly integrated. And even though desegregation was passed by the Supreme Court four years before I was born, I was born in 58, it was passed in 54, schools did not integrate overnight. It took years, sometimes even decades, for schools to integrate. So, I, you know, I, I did not understand why people couldn't get along. We all got along overseas. So, to, that was my community. And so I, I have had, you know, traveling as a kid with my parents and now traveling as a musician on tour around the world or whatever, when you combine those two sets of travels, as I mentioned earlier, I've been to 62 countries on six continents. I've played in all 50 states. What does that mean? Um, besides, I have a lot of frequent flyer miles and hotel points. What it means is I have been exposed to a multitude of cultures, ethnicities, skin colors, ideologies, religions, etc., And all of that has helped shape who I've become. According to the US Census Bureau, only 37% of Americans even own passports. So that means we don't do a whole lot of travel, whether it's black or white. And so the experiences that I've had are not common to many people. Um, that all this travel does not make me a better human being than anybody else, don't get me wrong. But what it does is it gives me a better and broader perspective on humanity. And I can tell you something, no matter how far I go from my own country, the United States, whether it's right next door to Canada, or right next door to Mexico, or halfway around the globe, no matter how different the people may be who I encounter, Perhaps they don't look like me, they don't speak my language, or they don't worship as I do, or whatnot. I always conclude one thing, that everybody I have encountered is a human being. And as such, everybody wants these five core values in their lives. Everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to be respected. We all want to be heard. We all want to be treated fairly and truthfully. And we all want the same things for our family as anyone else wants for their family. And if we can learn to use those five core values when we find ourselves in an adversarial situation, it doesn't have to be about race. There are other hot topics. Abortion, nuclear weapons, global warming, the last presidential election, the one coming up, the war in the Middle East, the war between Russia and Ukraine. You're on one side, I'm on the other side, okay? You use those five core values when you're dealing with an adversary. 
I will guarantee you, your, naviga your navigation of that adversarial situation, that society um, in which you are uncomfortable or unfamiliar will become a lot more positive, okay? And, 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 and a lot more productive when you apply those values. My favorite quote of all time is by Mark Twain, and it's called the travel quote. And Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. So those detractors that I have, um, I don't hate them. You know, I acknowledge them, I give them the time to speak to me, okay? But I realize they've not had that benefit of travel, and I try to share that with them vicariously. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Preach. Thank you. All right, next winner, uh, Chris, come on up here. Give Chris a round of applause. Hey, buddy. Hey, hey, how are y'all doing? Pretty good. So, uh, what's on your mind? Ah, so I'm Chris Duguid on Minds.com. Uh, not on any other social media sites, so you probably don't know who I am. <laughs> and uh, I just, uh, whew, wow. This is uh, quite a experience, so. I'm, I'm grateful for being here. Welcome, welcome. Thanks, man. So what I got to say isn't really easy to sum up in a couple of sentences and, uh, you know, just a few seconds or minutes. But I'll do my best, and with your help, I'll do, but do better. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so here we go. <laughs> Communication uh, is lacking. So we have uh, not been really fully communicating with each other. It's uh, more of a lack of communication by way of uh, confusion in our language. There's so many levels of meaning within various words, various sects of, of uh, construction, uh, different uh, occupations, uh, all the different things. And we are supposed to rely on something that is deceiving us. So what do you, what do you mean by that? What's deceiving us? <sighs> like I said, there's so many meanings within one word. Or give us three, so we'll, what, what are three things that deceive us? Our government, our court system, our education system, our police, our, you know, our safety protectors. There's so many levels of deception, and we're, there's so many people that are not willing to admit that we have been deceived. And is your, if, if I may, so I just want to make sure that I understand to make it helpful. And is the idea that because there are these forces of deception in society, that makes conversations more difficult? For sure, yeah. And so is the question, what then do we do about it? That's what we need to have more conversation about. Okay, so and, do, you, do and you want everyone on the panel to say, given that there are mechanisms in society that deceive us, and there's already confusion in terms like we had today, you and I discussed God, or faith, or what have you, how do we proceed to have a meaningful conversation? Is that the, I don't want to put words in, I'm trying to understand, is that? That's part of it, yeah, for sure. There's okay. so many more levels, but yeah, that's a good start. Um, so here's something that, <clears throat> I think is, is essential for political conversation. Uh, I think that you have to 
come at political conversation, this is very hard to do, but you have to come at political conversations with the understanding that people are truly trying to advocate for what they think is the best for the country. That when people on the left talk about how 12-year-olds need to be on puberty blockers, it's because they really do feel like there are trans children that are that young that need access to this medication, otherwise they'll kill themselves. When conservatives say things like, we need to prohibit all children from accessing HRT, it's because conservatives genuinely do feel like there is a social contagion that is pushing children to making bad medical decisions. Once you start from a place where at the very least you both acknowledge that each side is trying to do what they think is best, at least you can start having real conversations about what everybody's trying to do. But when you start from the place of people on the left are groomers and they're trying to trans all the kids for social media clout, or people on the right just want to kill all trans people because they're genocidal, the, 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 the room for conversation is over. At that point, it just becomes, I guess, adversarial in like a violent manner. Like at that point, you just have to start shooting each other because there's nothing you can do from that point once you've assumed that the other political side is evil. So um, I, would, I would even take issue with the framing of the question. When you say that people are being deceitful, I don't think people are genuinely trying to be deceitful. I think they're selling you their perception of reality that they really do think is true. It's just that we happen to disagree on those perceptions. I, I want to I, I want to underscore something that you said. I think one of the most important things when you have a conversation with someone across the divide is to not assume that they're a, a lunatic or right? evil or yeah. evil or bad or insane or just what extend a are? charitable huh? So what if they are? Oh, well, that's a totally different question. But, but don't go into the conversation assuming that they want the worst for everybody and they're just malintent. And that's what we see is the norm in conversations now. People who disagree with us are all of a sudden existential threats. So I, I, I think it's really important, I want to underscore that, when you have a conversation, just start with the fact that they're probably a decent person. Maybe they have a disagreement. And it's OK that people have disagreements at the end of the day. You, you, you don't, you, th this idea that we have to have friends or people with whom we have relationships who have to agree with everything we believe, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, you should have a a friends with a diversity of opinions, and you have far better conversations and engage them. But don't assume the people with whom you're having a conversation with are just inherently bad people from the get-go. And there is one, one thing that I found from literally doing this my whole life, writing about it, et cetera, is that one reason that can conversations go awry right from the get-go, and I still make this mistake in spite of how many times I've done this, is that you don't define the terms right up from the bat. And I know that must sound academic, but it's just not. Like, what do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by, like, what we did today? What do you mean by faith? What do you mean by God? I had a conversation with a guy. I post my bad conversations, too, so people will learn from the mistakes that I made. Uh, I had a conversation with a guy, and we had a disagreement on whether there should be open borders. And I just assumed that that what he meant by a border was what I meant by a border. But what he meant by a border was like a World War I trench, where people like dug these big trenches in the ground. So forget about like trans issues or uh, 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 you know gender or sex. That's another one that's inherently fraught with confusion. Asking people to define the difference between gender and sex, and then have can people change their sex is very different from can people change their gender. So I found really extraordinarily helpful right from the beginning after we assume that people ha are, not, are not maniacs, that they have ch you know, charitable interpretation of their motives, well, what do you mean by that? Just, I always put the framing on myself. Just so that I can understand, help me understand what you mean by that. So then you're on the same page for the conversation. So that's one key thing I'd suggest. Wouldn't it be a lot easier if you didn't have to do all that work every time with each individual? We could all well, come together. Yeah, but you'd Hold never, on, you'd if never we could know. all come together and come up with a communication that is more on a level playing field? You, you, that you, is, you would never, the English language. Yeah, you would never Partially, know what yeah, well, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't posit to know everything or say that I can come up with this by myself, but if we all come together and have this conversation, then we have an opportunity to, to change that. I think, huh. I think more specific language is extremely helpful, and a lot of people will just say overly broad words and that is a huge problem. I completely agree. So I don't like I mean to your point, we're not gonna create a new language. However, being specific 
as specific as possible so that we're not you know alienating anybody I, it's it's very helpful I, I think Peter made a wonderful point which is I which and it's ironic in a way because he suggests what GK Chesterton the Christian apologetics writer termed the great Christian virtue of charity right that we should give charity we should be charitable with people and assume that their intentions are, are good even when c circumstances would lead us to believe otherwise and to address Chris directly it's a difficult thing to do because it requires faith you actually have to have some kind of faith in order to um, undergird this this uh, this assertion that people can be good but by the way if you want a direct answer to your question the issue is that we have a bureaucracy we have a sort of an, an unelected unaccountable bureaucracy in this country and then we have elected people frankly who also have diffuse and often not wonderful interests that are that are playing a role too but that being said I think that Peter's suggestion to be charitable is actually the healthiest approach. We should actually just assume the best about our fellow Americans, our fellow Canadians, because if we don't, it's a world of pain. It's a world of assuming that all of this incompetence is intentional. But in reality, it's not intentional malice. It's just a series of incompetence-driven blunders that plague us because we have an old system that needs maybe a little bit of a tune-up. And, uh, and that's all. You, you could think about it like this. Is it that somebody knowingly does a bad thing, or is it that people's sense of good is hyper-attenuated? It's, it's just, it's on steroids, and then they act like they do because they think they're doing good things. I would say it's definitely the latter. Cool. So, yes. Um, we got one more question. We're over time. So thank you, Chris, for coming out, man. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. All right. John. John, come up. We got one more question, then we go to the next panel. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, buddy. Give John a hello. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, so um, I'm uh, John G, 76, on Mines. And I've been a member of Mines for about two years now. And uh, before I get into my topic, I just want one thing I just wanted to mention is that I know there are people that cross post from Twitter and other sites. And uh, there's sometimes people on Mines, like I, I only um, use Mines as a social network. I don't use other ones like Twitter and that kind of thing. So just as a suggestion, if people that do. Uh, if people that um, cross post from Twitter can maybe just uh, maybe once a day, once a week, once a month, come on to Mines and Gab and all these other sites that you cross post to, um, I think you would you know build up more engagement for the people that are all exclusively on those channels, and uh, just in, it'll bring a little more community into the, the whole picture there. Um, for my background, I'm uh, an automotive engineer um, in the Detroit area, and I'm currently working on uh, battery vehicles, work on a component on, on those battery vehicles. Talking to the mic a little bit more. Okay. Um, so I work on, okay, so I work on like the battery vehicles um, and like on a component on them, and I know there's um, the direction that we want to go like for... They're aiming at like 2035 to have this big conversion from gasoline and diesel vehicles. Um, and with that, you know, just me looking into some of the numbers there, um, I see that like as of 2020, there was about 286 million registered vehicles in the U.S. And looking into like how much we have for production capacity, it's in the neighborhood of maybe like 11 to 15, 16 million per year. And at this point, a lot of that is still like the internal combustion engines. 
maybe like one or two million or something in that range for um, the electric vehicles. Now, what that means is that for 2035, we're not going to meet like anywhere near that 286 million vehicles by that time. So, just you know, for with okay, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, um, with with that, you know, just I want. Um, I'm not sure like uh, where we really want to, well, my idea is that we want to go with more of a target of like what is our overall goal for, you know, the, and like for, for this example, it would be like carbon capture or like, you know, reducing the carbon in the atmosphere, whether it's carbon capture. Can I, can I just ask you a question just so that I understand? So you, there are 286 million vehicles in the U.S. and so, so what is your question around okay, I, that? I'm trying to get to that. So like, okay. I guess my, my focus here is, you know, to try and wrap it up here a bit, is just, you know, I, my proposal would be to focus more on the overall goal and not dictate how you're going to get there. And I think where that becomes a problem is if you dictate, like, oh, we got to convert all the vehicles to battery vehicles and that kind of thing, rather than all the other options that could be out there, whether you're doing carbon capture and turning it into graphene and that kind of thing, like Ian talks about. Um, there's plenty of other ways that we can be investigating with this. So, I mean, I'm just using this as an example because I'm familiar with it. But just as a policy, I think we need to just go so, so use these. Um, so is a broader no, goal better yeah. than, a, than a specific policy? Exactly. And so okay. that, that's kind of what my idea is. Like just, and if you're going to set some goals, set them more short term. Right. So like maybe within like a development cycle. Right. So, that kind so, of thing. so personally, I think you make a very good point. And I think that when it comes to government policies, maybe um, very specific uh, initiatives, you know, they're, they're, they're doomed to fail. Look at Stalin's five-year plan. I don't really know anything about this topic, to be honest with you. But, uh, but, but maybe you have a point. Anyone else? I'll throw something out. I think it depends on what the specific goal is and what the broad goal is. Somebody told me something, fortunately, when I was younger, and if you're younger in the audience, I think this is an extremely helpful way to think about it. Think about the person, this is the goal directed. Think about the person you want to be when you're, I'll just pull my age, 56. Where do you want to be in your life? What type of person do you want to be? Then think about what you would need to do at 46 to get there and then 36 and 26. Usually what people do is they think, what do I want to do next year and the year after that? Or maybe I want to go to this college or this graduate school or work at this firm. But that doesn't look at the big picture. That's not the long frame picture. So I think when you, I like the framing of the question. I thought it was really good. So when you talk about specific goals, should you have broader goals and more specific goals? I think the idea is it depends. So as a society, what should we be doing in terms of mandating how many vehicles and how many are battery driven? Again, it's not my field. I the faintest clue, uh, but what I think we should do is we think we should think about, you know, from the seven habits of highly effective people. Begin with the end in mind. So, what's the end? What do we want to do? Do we want to carbon capture? Do we want to make carbon sinks? Do we want to get off foreign oil? And then, when you do that, then you work backward to figure out how you get to the goal. So, I think that's a way to think about the problem that's useful and effective, and it, it cut, just cuts through the noise. Right. Yeah, because I mean, I, I think with. Um, you know, with, with technology changing constantly, that's why I'm recommending doing this as like a short-term goal because by like 2035, there probably will be, you know, vehicles out there that run better than the battery vehicles, you know, so the technology will change. And True that, John. We're going to so, get there quicker. Yeah, Let's make so it I think faster. that's why I'm just saying focus on like maybe short-term goals, but keep the, the overall goal and then also reevaluate the overall goal periodically as well. It's like, do we really need to pull that much carbon out of the atmosphere? Or for that example. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, please. But cool. Th yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, John. Give it up for our first panel, guys. All right. We're
J just run down because uh, just so everyone can do a plug for where people can find them. Um, maybe start with Daryl, Peter, Matthew, and Chris. Uh, you can find me at DarylDavis.com. That's D-A-R-Y-L. Only one R. There's another Daryl Davis, D-A-R-R-Y-L. If you go to him, he'll, he's a real estate agent. He tried to sell you a house. So <laughs> D-A-R-Y-L, D-A-V-I-S.com. Thank you all very much for having Thank me. You. Peter Bogosian, National Progress Alliance, and I'm mostly active on Twitter and YouTube. It's at Peter, P-E-T-E-R Bogosian, B-O-G-H-O-S-S-I-A-N. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Hi, all. So I'm the founder of Based Records. We're going to have a series of uh, little concerts, little sets, after the political discussions are all wrapped up. Uh, we got Winston Marshall from Mumford & Sons. We've got... She's amazing. We've got Suzanne Santo. I don't know if she's in the audience, but she's amazing. You. And we've got the always amazing Jeffrey Steele and Ira Dean. <laughs> Country music royalty, so please do stick around after all the discussions are over. Chris Williamson, Chris Williamson on YouTube, and Modern Wisdom Podcast everywhere else that you listen. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you don't need et cetera, et cetera. You don't need to shout. We're staying up here. Well, just in case somebody's leaving, youtube.com slash listening, okay? okay. <laughs>